Welcome to the deep dive. We've uh, got quite a stack of your sources here today. Yeah, research papers, studies, notes. All digging into, well, a really fascinating and, you know, often misunderstood topic. Definitely. The psychology behind cuckolding fantasies. Exactly. And maybe a bit taboo for some. It's certainly an area where the science is um, peeling back layers, showing some pretty surprising things about desire. Absolutely. So our mission today really is to unpack what might be driving these fantasies. Look at the science, the history. Right, and the psychological functions they might actually serve for people. And we should say up front, some findings are, well, counterintuitive. Yeah, research suggests these fantasies are surprisingly common. And get this, for some people, they're actually linked to more relationship satisfaction. Which sounds odd, doesn't it? It really does. Okay, let's unpack this. Right, so where do we start? Prevalence seems key. How common are they? Well, Dr. Justin Lee Miller did this landmark study, you know, in the archives of sexual behavior, over 4,000 Americans. And the numbers, they really made people look twice. He found 58% of men. 58. Yeah. And 42% of women reported having these fantasies at some point. Okay, so definitely not some tiny fringe thing. We're talking about a huge chunk in the population. Exactly. And the follow-up you mentioned, the link to relationship health. Mm-hmm. That just seems totally backward to common assumptions. It really does, doesn't it? <laughs> Dr. Le Miller's later work looked at who has these fantasies and um, how it relates to their relationships. Yeah. And what he found was pretty striking. People who engage with these fantasies regularly, hmm. they actually scored higher on relationship satisfaction. Oh, higher. Higher satisfaction. And they felt they had better sexual communication with their partners better than people who didn't have these fantasies. Okay, hang on, this is where it gets really interesting. Right. Because the usual story is, oh, these fantasies mean you're unhappy, you want someone else. Yeah, that they signal a problem. But this research kind of flips that. It suggests it could even be a positive sign. Precisely. It suggests that for a lot of folks, these fantasies aren't about ditching their partner. They seem to be doing something within the relationship framework itself. So, okay, if they're common, maybe even linked to relationship health, what's actually going on in our heads, like biologically, when someone's having one. Let's dive into the neurobiology. Okay, yeah. Dr. Barry Komasaruk's fMRI research at Rutgers. That gives us a bit of a window. Right. What did they see? It's fascinating. During the fantasy, you get multiple brain areas lighting up at the same time. Okay. Areas for sexual arousal, obviously, but also areas for emotional processing. And kind of surprisingly, areas linked to the stress response. Wait, arousal, emotion, and stress all at once. That sounds confusing, maybe not pleasant. It does sound like a strange mix, but that simultaneous activation might actually be part of the appeal. How so? Well, you see specific regions like the anterior cingulate cortex that's involved in processing emotional conflict, activating right alongside the nucleus accumbens. The reward center. Exactly, the brain's reward center. So the brain seems to be processing this really emotionally complex thing while also flagging it as potentially rewarding. Huh, that combination. Complexity and reward, that feels important. What about the um, the intensity? Some people describe a really strong pull towards these fantasies. Yeah, that links straight to the brain's reward system, specifically dopamine. Ah, dopamine. Dr. Wolfram Schultz's work on dopamine and something called prediction error is really relevant here. Prediction error. Yeah, so dopamine isn't just about feeling good, it's about motivation, learning especially when a reward is uncertain or unexpected. Our brains actually release more dopamine for rewards that are new, unexpected, or even feel a bit forbidden. Ah, the forbidden fruit idea, the taboo. Exactly. Fantasizing about your partner with someone else often pushes against some deep social or personal rules, right? Sure. So that creates this powerful prediction error signal. Mm -hmm. It's a scenario that's potentially rewarding, sexually stimulating, but also highly uncertain or transgressive. That neurochemical kick? Yeah, that kick, that mix of uncertainty and novelty can make these fantasies feel incredibly compelling. It can even intensify the desire over time. Okay, that explains the drive, the intensity. Are other brain systems involved? Oh, definitely. Dr. Helen Fisher's work is useful here. She talks about distinct brain systems for lust, romantic attraction, and deep attachment. Right, the three systems. And they can operate kind of independently. So You can have a really strong, secure attachment bond with your partner that's driven by oxytocin, vasopressin. Those systems stay active during the fantasy Uh while your lust system gets stimulated by the fantasy scenario, even if it involves someone else. So the fantasy doesn't automatically threaten the core bond. 
the neurobiology suggests it doesn't have to. And, you know, Dr. Meredith Small's research points out the brain is wired for novelty seeking. Dopamine, again, right. newer, varied stuff grabs the brain's attention, feels more rewarding. So these fantasies offer a kind of mental novelty, mental variation. Keeps things interesting, even in a monogamous context. Could be. It provides that novel stimulus, but in a safe internal space, like mental cross-training for the libido, maybe. Uh -huh. I like that. What about jealousy? That seems like a big elephant in the room. It is. And Dr. Helen Fisher looked at jealousy specifically. In real life, jealousy often lights up brain areas tied to pain, social rejection, even obsessive thinking. Yeah, it feels awful. But in the controlled space of a fantasy, you can play with elements of jealousy while also triggering reward pathways. How does that work? It creates what some call benign masochism, finding pleasure in something that would be genuinely painful if it were real. Because you're in control. Exactly, because it's happening in a safe, imagined space where you're ultimately pulling the strings. Benign masochism, that's a really evocative phrase. Does something like empathy play a role here? It could. Dr. Simon Baron Cohen's work on empathy is relevant, especially when we think about compersion. Compersion. Feeling happy about your partner's happiness. Right. Feeling joy from their pleasure, even if it's with someone else in the fantasy. His research suggests people higher in empathy might be more likely to experience this. Why? They're mirror neuron systems. The parts of the brain that help us feel what others feel might be more active. So they could be vicariously experiencing their partner's imagined pleasure in the fantasy. And that becomes part of their pleasure. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Especially for highly empathetic people. Mm -mm. And, you know, just engaging with sexual fantasies generally, even complex ones like these, might have broader benefits. Dr. Eli Meston found links to things like lower cortisol, better mood. So not just mental, but physiological benefits too, like stress relief. It suggests that, yeah, it's not just a thought exercise. It can impact well-being. Wow. Okay, that's a ton of brain science. Let's zoom out a bit. Is this just a modern psychological thing, or are there deeper roots? Yeah. Evolutionary. Historical. Well, evolutionary psychology offers some uh, provocative theories, though sometimes controversial. Like what? Dr. Robin Baker proposed the sperm competition hypothesis. Sperm competition? The idea is that male psychology might have evolved responses linked to the possibility of female partners having sex with rivals. Okay. And his studies are pretty wild. He found that men, when shown scenarios suggesting a rival, yeah. showed this significant unconscious biological response. Mm. They produce way more sperm. How much more? Sometimes up to 300% more. Whoa! 300%. Yes. It's just from seeing something suggesting competition. Yep. And it happens below conscious awareness. Mm. It suggests some kind of deep, maybe ancient biological program related to rivalry. Yeah. Then you have Dr. Christopher Ryan looking at it anthropologically. He challenges the idea that strict sexual exclusivity was always the human norm. Citing pre-agricultural society. Right. Like the Masuo or certain aboriginal groups where sexual norms were more fluid. He argues maybe our default setting wasn't always strict monogamy. And there's physical evidence, too. He points to anatomical stuff like features of genitals, sperm characteristics that seem more consistent with evolution in a sexually competitive environment. So his hypothesis is that maybe these kinds of fantasies are like vestigial programs, leftovers from our evolutionary past. So not necessarily serving a biological function now, but still part of our psychological wiring. An echo. That's one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. It frames these desires not as broken or wrong, but maybe as really old patterns. Okay, so they're common, biologically complex, maybe historically rooted. What psychological job are they doing for people now? What purpose do they serve today? Right, this is where the psychological research gets really practical. Dr. Eli Finkel talks about emotional regulation. Meaning? Think of the fantasy as a safe zone, an internal space where you can explore really intense emotions or desires, even forbidden ones, without any real world fallout. Because you're in control. Exactly. Yeah. Your prefrontal cortex, the executive control part of your brain is online. You know it's not real, you direct the narrative. Which brings us back to that control paradox. The theme might be losing control, but the fantasizer is totally in control. Precisely. And Dr. Albert Bandura's work on self-efficacy, our basic need for agency, fits right in here. We need to feel like we have some mastery over our experiences. Uh -huh. And these fantasies, kind of paradoxically, give you that sense of complete mastery within the imagined world. If you feel powerless elsewhere in life, this might be especially appealing. Right. Agency expressed privately. What about self-esteem? How might 
these fantasies affect how someone feels about themselves or the relationship. Dr. Mark Leary's sociometer theory is interesting here. He suggests self-esteem acts like an internal gauge. A sociometer? Yeah, measuring how accepted or valued you feel, including as a mate. So fantasizing about your partner being super desired by others, yeah. attractive, powerful others, yeah. it can actually inflate your internal sociometer yeah. in a controlled way. Boost your self-esteem because your partner is seen as high value. Kind of. It yeah. taps into mate copying. Yeah. You know, finding someone more attractive if others want them. Right. The fantasy lets you have this controlled mate copying experience. It can reinforce your view of your partner's desirability and, by extension, your own status for being with them psychological validation. That's a fascinating way to frame it. We mentioned compersion neurobiologically. Does it have a psychological function too? Definitely. Dr. Terry Conley's work shows compersion, that positive buzz from your partner's pleasure can be explored, maybe even cultivated through these fantasies. So for some, the fantasy is a way to access that specific feeling. It can be. If you're prone to compersion, the fantasy provides a space to experience that selfless kind of pleasure which is very different from jealousy. Her research even shows different hormone profiles linked to compersion versus jealousy. Wow, so the pleasure is really about imagining their joy. For some, that's a key part. And Dr. Meredith Small brought up the voyeuristic element too. Which is often there. She connects it to basic human sexual learning. Historically, watching sexual behavior wasn't hidden. It had social educational functions. Privacy is pretty recent. So the voyeurism taps into ancient learning mechanisms. Plausibly, yes. It's another deep echo, maybe. Okay, does how someone generally feels about themselves sexually influence this, their sexual self-esteem? Oh, massively. Dr. Eli Sheff's research really highlights this. People with higher sexual self-esteem, they tend to be way more comfortable exploring complex fantasies, including these. Without shame or anxiety. Right. And they're better at keeping that fantasy reality boundary clear. But if someone has lower sexual self-esteem, yeah. they're more likely to feel distress, guilt, they might misinterpret the fantasy as proof something's wrong with them or the relationship. So your baseline sexual confidence really colors the whole experience. Mm. Okay, what about external stuff? Our relationships, upbringing, society, how do they shape these fantasies? The attachment styles are huge. Dr. Cindy Hazan, Dr. Sue Johnson, their work shows our early relationship blueprints affect our adult fantasy lives. How so? Well, someone with an anxious attachment might see themes of abandonment and reunion pop up, even here. Someone avoidant might focus more on distance or control within the fantasy narrative. And secure attachment. Securely attached folks who have these fantasies often find it easier to process them, maybe even talk about them, integrate them, without it feeling like a huge threat to the relationship. So your core relationship wiring shows up in your fantasy world. Yeah, it can definitely color the themes and feelings. And social learning matters too, of course. Dr. John Bancroft at Kinsey. Uh-huh. He showed how our fantasy lives really start developing in adolescence. Mm -hmm. We're influenced by media, peers, societal messages about sex, competition, what's desirable. So early exposure shapes the pathways. It seems to. Early imprinting can lay down neural tracks that influence later patterns. What about gender differences? We saw prevalence rates were a bit different, but what about the content of the fantasies? Yeah, Dr. Meredith Small looked into this. If you control for social desirability bias, people maybe not admitting things. Right. The rates look pretty similar. Yeah. But the content often varies. Women's fantasies tend to have more emotional detail, maybe focus on the ongoing relationship dynamics between the partner and the other person. More narrative complexity. Exactly. More emotional context. Men's fantasies often focus more on the visual aspects, performance, the sexual act itself, maybe with less emphasis on the surrounding emotional story. Seems to fit broader patterns of gender socialization around sex. It does seem to reflect that. And the wider culture history. Dr. Christopher Fisher did cross-cultural work, 37 cultures. Really interesting pattern. Societies with more restrictive sexual norms. Yeah. They often report higher rates of transgressive sexual fantasies, including these partner-sharing ones. The forbidden fruit effect again. Seems like it. What's repressed in reality gets explored more in the mind. And historically, as we touched on, themes of sharing, voyeurism, they pop up in art, literature, across time and cultures. Suggest so these aren't new concerns. They're kind of universal aspects of human sexuality. That's the implication. The mind finds ways to explore what society restricts. Okay, bringing it back to the relationship itself, you mentioned that initial surprising finding about satisfaction. Is there clinical evidence for talking about this stuff? 
Yes, absolutely. Dr. Barry McCarthy's clinical work with over a thousand couples is key here. What did he find? He found that couples who felt safe enough to openly discuss any complex sexual fantasies, whatever the content, reported significantly higher relationship satisfaction overall. Just the talking helps. It seems so. Sharing those vulnerable private parts of your inner world apparently builds intimacy, trust, and crucially, the communication skills that help the whole relationship. That's really powerful. The ability to talk about the fantasy is beneficial, even if you never, ever act on it. Exactly. Which leads us right to the next big question, fantasy versus reality. What happens if couples do want to try and bridge that gap? Well, Dr. Amy Moores at Chapman University studied couples who tried this. It's uh, not simple. Doesn't sound like it would be. Her longitudinal studies show success usually requires a pretty specific and kind of rare combination of things. Like what? Extremely high levels of communication, naturally low jealousy levels to begin with, strong sexual self-esteem in both partners, and often some prior experience with sexual variety. So it's a high bar. It's a very high bar. It's not a common or easy path for most couples. And is acting it out always the goal? or even necessary. That's the crucial point from Dr. Moore's research too. Many couples discover that just exploring the fantasy deeply, talking about it openly, mm. that often met the underlying psychological needs perfectly well. Without ever needing to do it in real life. Exactly. Understanding why they had the desire, what function it served in their dynamic, yeah. that was often way more valuable and fulfilling than actually enacting the scene. That's a really vital distinction. So for therapists working with people exploring these fantasies, What's the takeaway? Dr. Michael Aaron, a therapist specializing in this, really emphasizes the goal isn't to get rid of the fantasy. No. The focus should be on understanding its psychological functions. What need is it meeting? What aspects appeal and why? Exploring the meaning behind it. Right. That self-knowledge can improve intimacy communication. Then you can figure out how to meet those underlying needs within the relationship structure. Mm. That might involve trying new things, or it might just involve understanding and acceptance. It doesn't automatically mean opening the relationship. And just having these fantasies doesn't mean someone secretly wants non-monogamy. Absolutely not. Dr. Elizabeth Sheff's long-term research confirms this. She's studied people with these fantasies, and often they explicitly do not want to act on them. Why not? They recognize the fantasy provides unique things, maybe the intensity of the taboo, the safety of total control that reality just wouldn't offer in the same way. For many, the fantasy is complete psychological experience in itself. It serves its purpose purely as a fantasy. Precisely. Wow. This has been such a deep and I think really illuminating dive into something pretty complex. It really shows you how many layers there are, doesn't it? Mm. Biological, psychological, social, historical. Yeah. It's all intertwined. And the research again and again seems to point away from simple judgment. These fantasies show up across the board in psychologically healthy people and seem to serve real functions. Yeah, they aren't necessarily a sign that something's broken. It really shifts the conversation towards curiosity, towards understanding. Mm -hmm. So what does this all mean for you listening? Maybe the real takeaway from all this research isn't about labeling these desires good or bad. Right. It's more about, well, healthy integration, understanding the underlying functions these complex fantasies might be serving for you. Is it about emotional regulation, control, self-esteem, novelty, compersion? Figuring out the why. Exactly. And using that self-knowledge can help you navigate your inner world and make informed choices for building relationship practices, whatever they look like, that feel satisfying, ethical, and right for you and your partner. It's about understanding the message your fantasy might be sending, maybe, rather than just fearing the image it presents. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.